Hi, thanks. Um, I am going to be talking today about two-way peg, just as this title suggests. So this is a joint work with Dan Bonet and Michael Straka back when they were both at Stanford University. Um, and um, yeah, let's, let's dive right in. So two-way peg, the best way I can summarize a two-way peg is a mechanism that enables reversible token migration. So here's my definition. The two-way peg is that mechanism which migrates assets back and forth between disjoint blockchains. So you have to be able to get it back. So this is sort of, I just to contrast this with the atomic swap or an exchange, the two-way peg actually ch switches which blockchain consensus determines ownership of a particular asset. So when I transfer it uh, over two-way peg, I'm now allowing another consensus mechanism to say who owns what. And this, this was sort of a program that was initiated by Blockstream back in as, as early as 2000, in 2014. Um, so let us. Uh, Let's move on to wow. Bitcoin, shall we? That's a, a virtual. So I just roll, roll, roll our minds back. 2014. So this is another. You know, another, another coin you might feel with called the Dogecoin. It's essentially to make a bobsled team to the Olympics in 2014 with a $30,000 crowd, crowdsourced donation. Um, had a bounty that actually went out to build this two-way peg between Dogecoin and Ethereum, which peaked off at 6,492 ETH before somebody decided to withdraw 5,000 ethers. Um, and probably most importantly for, for, for the purpose of this talk is to acknowledge the special uh, Dogecoin Creole, which there is a, a so, sort of manual written here by Tessa Marshall, I encourage you guys, linguists, to, to check it out. But the, the important vocabulary to learn is this, this word wow, which we're going to use to sort of explain the rest of how this bridge works. OK, great. So Doge Ethereum, as you might guess, this is the combination of Dogecoin and Ethereum. It's the two-way peg between Dogecoin and Ethereum, which connects to that bridge bounty that I just mentioned a moment ago. So the three players in this game, OK? So you have a Doge, which is a native Dogecoin uh, coin, I guess, if that's perhaps redundant. But uh, again, Dogecoin, just a regular blockchain, well, regular like, 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 like Bitcoin. In other words, no, no, no smart contracts or anything like that. So when the Doge comes over and crosses into Ethereum, it becomes this token called WOW, which I call a tokenized Doge, which formerly is an ERC-20 token. And then, of course, you also have Ether that sits on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, probably most people here are familiar with Ethereum, um, and that sort of functions as the collateral in this, in this bridge. So, so in a sense, the Doge is going to migrate to Ethereum in the form of WOW. The Ethereum ETH always stays where it is in Ether. So just to, to hit this home, so if you're going to start off with Doge and the Dogecoin network, you, lock, you would lock uh, a Dogecoin into a particular address over there, and then this allows this bridge contract in Ethereum. Somehow that triggers a minting of a wow and you, whatever, you send it to your friend for a birthday present, whatever you're done when you're ready, that person sends it back here and when you unlock, might be unlocked by a very different person than the person who locked it in the first place. Okay, so it's really a motivating problem. This is especially a motivating problem for, for TrueBit, but to say that uh, um, is, is the following issue, that this, this bridge contract over here, this bridge contract, Ethereum has to be able to verify uh, Dogecoin events. So um, at, the, at the very least, this means we have to be able to check Dogecoin proof of work. But of course, the Dogecoin's escrow proof of work is, is memory hard. So just to illustrate the hardness. So there was uh, Vitalik and Terra made a, made a um, naive verification for a single Dogecoin proof of work, which was running 370 million gas, over 118 Ethereum transactions. Um, and, and of course, you, know, you also need to somehow communicate those, those Dogecoin headers to, into, into Ethereum. So this was uh, an estimate of maybe $10,000 per day. Um, maybe slightly cheaper now, but definitely not 
really um, affordable. So that was really the motivation for this project of TrueBid was to be able to check a Dogecoin proof of work inside of an Ethereum smart contract. So I sort of summarize, for, it'll just be a black box for the purpose of this talk, but it's the purpose of the, of the protocol is to enable smart contracts to securely process large computations in standard programming languages, including the one which the um, S-script uh, Dogecoin proof of work is written in. So there we go. So in terms of sort of what you'd expect from a bridge like this, I mean, you want it, obviously this are, it should be something democratic, meaning that there are no distinguished nodes, exchange rate oracles, everyone can participate. Organic here means that there are no changes to the underlying blockchain systems. As I put in the title, it's, it's um, a retrofitting um, protocol. So you also want something liquid so that you can cross without explicitly identifying the exchange partners. Crossing means taking a doge and turning it into a wow. And then, of course, you know, rational actors. We don't need to assume altruistic nodes and that nobody's going to put funds in the system unless they eventually get them back out. And, of course, efficiency, fastness. So design challenge. So as I sort of alluded to in the, in the previous slides, you have the issue of consensus, what I called overcoming myopia, which is that sort of the Ethereum miners can't see what's going on in Dogecoin. Somehow they have to know what happened over there in order to um, you know, generate wow and so forth. Uh, in computation, of course, this involves, as I mentioned, checking the Dogecoin proof of work. And then finally, what I called politics. In other words, what does it mean to lock a Doge in Dogecoin? As we said, there are no smart contracts. So presumably, um, you need to um, have some mechanism for, for, for locking a Doge. OK, so probably we need to change this, the, the software. That is a political solution which we engage the miners. So how exactly what I say. So political solution. So your, your simple, naive approach here would be to add a lock, lock opcode to Dogecoin using some software fork. And again, I guess just to emphasize here, that when you lock Doge, this is how you, you mint WoW. So the adoption barriers, of course, is a, a ch challenge because Dogecoin repo was sort of, um, as of October 2018, when this paper came out, the repo had been sort of unchanged for the last three years. And on top of that, the Dogecoin is also merged mined with Litecoin, which means that we're not really just appealing to Dogecoin mined miners, but actually to, to Litecoin miners when we're doing this. So you need, we needed something big to sort of get the community attention so the miners could activate forks. So this is when we brought uh, Jessica Angel, artist, into this, into this picture. Um, and so we, we, we came up with a, a structure that we thought might work. So in other words, you talk here, like, so you got Dogecoin on the, on the left and, and Ethereum on the right, and these are both sort of shaped like Merbius bands. So they're sort of, you know, if you take a strip of paper and put a half twist and glue it back together, that's what you get. And essentially, you're going to glue two Merbius bands together. Well, you can't really do that in three space without self-intersection. But if you could, you'd end up with something that looks like this, a Klein bottle. So there, the world's largest Klein bottle would be sitting there in, in, in Vancouver. And there you can see it sort of um, adjacent to the bay uh, with, you know, sort of specific... Uh, Lighting plan and, the, and of course, a, a structure which, which would permit it to be not blow over in the wind. Here it's making this out of, of course, plexiglass and steel. The aluminum was, was too light, that was thing. And then, of course, inside you'd have these, you have these exhibits, like this is Holly's demonstrating the, the physical proof of work. So bang on this until you can sort of light up the thing. <laughs> so, 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 so that's, that's what's going on inside of that thing, and, and here, that, that, those, these are actually shots from the um, uh, ETH Denver in, in 2017, ETH Denver 2017, and again, great, ETH Denver 2018. Well, it turns out that we can actually build this two-way peg without introducing the new opcodes to, to the Dogecoin, so we don't, we don't actually need to um, do any of this stuff. So, so essentially, this is your, your forkless strategy. Um, so again, the, um, right, so we're, we're minting WoW when we, when we lock Doge and we're burning WoW to, to uh, when you burn WoW then you can lock the Doge back. So this is the general technique here, so the collateralized peg, right? So, um, so what, what, what we do is we have the operators which would put 
some sort of, it's, it's, this is all going to be done by e economics instead of um, sort of expanding the language of, of Dogecoin. So the operator is going to put, in order to create the bridge, you would put some collateral on the other side to make sure that um, when a crosser comes along to lock Doge, in order to get the wow in Ethereum, that if the operator would move, move the lock, move the um, Dogecoin out of the lock, then, then he can actually claim the operator's ETH collateral. So again, putting locked here because at any moment in this collateralized peg, the operator actually, there's nothing in the consensus protocol that prevents them from moving lock Doge. They don't move it because if they move it, then they lose their collateral in Ethereum. So really an important question here is, how much collateral do you need? And that's, that is an interesting uh, question because um, obviously the, the price of Ether relative to Doge can change over time. So I'll try to touch on that towards the end of this talk. Okay, so, so here it's just like an overview of what this, this system looks like. So you have these operators that are sitting in, um, so when you open, open a bridge, the operator's offering some sort of um, address in, in, in Dogecoin where you, can, where you can send your Doge to that you want to cross over. The crossers are gonna send it by locking into that address. And then once a relay, so we have a relayer will allow this minting to, to take place. So these are, arrows are just sort of indicating the sequence here. So then you can mint WOW on the other side and in which place the crosser becomes a hodler. He's holding a WOW token. And if you want to unlock it, then you're going to also have another instance from, from the relay. And of course, these are backstop modules, things that you don't actually want or expect to happen. But if, you know, if, you, if a operator does walk off with Doge, that has to be um, reported so that someone can collect their collateral and, and also backtrack in case for some, for some reason that the relay actually took in, um, uh, you know, there was a mistake. So, so let's see. So the question is, are we, are we gonna communicate these, be able to communicate these things correctly across the network? So um, let me just start off by saying some stuff that, that doesn't work. One thing that's, that's bad is orphan blocks. Nobody should be sending orphan blocks to the, um, to the bridge contract. If you did that, well, even if you did it by accident, that was bad, you shouldn't have done that. Um, uh, so we have to deal with that. The block verification, the sampling, so it's, it's hopeless to try to, if you're taking a bunch of blocks, Dogecoin blocks into Ethereum, bad idea to just sample them and say, well, if, I, if, if a couple of them were valid, then, then the whole chain is probably valid because obviously the adversary can, can hide um, one bad block anywhere in that chain. And then of course, this is just another thing that uh, can happen if two people try to cross the bridge at the same time. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it's possible that two people would send, there's nothing in Dogecoin preventing two people sending, sending money to the same address at the same time. So I just, to look at the orphan block example, so Dogecoin exception accepted by the bridge contract, this, this means there are basically two things you need to prevent the orphan blocks. One is that everything, you need, you need to have valid blocks and you need to make sure that these blocks actually appear on the true longest Dogecoin. So in this case, longest chain is the correct one, meaning the one with, really meaning the one with the most proof of work. Okay, so now I'm gonna put three properties here that I'm gonna say if you, if you satisfy these properties, then you're actually are, um, uh, uh, a valid extension. In other words, it, it really happened on Dogecoin. So first thing, this is maybe just kind of obvious, but you want the, all the blocks in this extension are gonna be valid, okay? So that's, that's, that means that all the proof of works are, are valid, it's actually a real chain, and that you also want that the extension, and I'll say also I want that the extension is close to maximal. And finally, that the, in other words, that you, nobody else could have found like a longer extension. You gave me the longest possible one, it's up to date. And also that there's, the extension is no shallow fork. So in other words, the, the blocks are confirmed. So you need to prevent, produce an additional witness that shows that these are actually 
confirmed blocks as well. So the way that you would dispute a, a type like this is, is, is two ways. Well, well the, the, there are only really two complaints that one could have about the uh, extension. One is that the extension is too short. You didn't give me a maximal one. And then I'll say, well, fine, then the, then the challenger, you should show a longer one. And then the other option is that the extension is actually invalid. There was some problem with the proof of work, and you have to actually check these, these proof of works, okay? So let's look at the, this is a, look at a challenge of the second type where we're claiming an extension would be invalid. So in this case, your relayer, whoever sent this across, who's on the other side of the challenge from the challenger, says, is basically has to give a bulletproof of this form saying, I know a valid confirmed n block Dogecoin extension starting with the latest known block X, that's relative to the bridge contract, and it's also ending with block Y. Okay, and then you can let Trubit check this bulletproof. So that's, that's what Trubit does, and of course, this is um, pretty, it's, it's it, the, the advantage here of sort of using these two is not only there's no trusted setup, Trubit has no trusted setup, and you know, uh, in contrast to you know, Snark, the bulletproof also has no trusted setup, and it's also space efficient. So the point here of the bulletproof isn't to do zero knowledge, but just simply to compact a bunch of proof of works into a small space on Ethereum. Okay, and you may be able to get some performance improvements with you know, recent work, for example, the, the Halo protocol, which is doing these recursive bulletproofs. Okay, and as I said, I want to get back to um, discussing the, the um, collateral price at the end. So, so again, uh, what, what we want to do is, well, the, the problem that we're addressing here is that the value of a Doge coin could, could rise in value relative to ETH over the course of time, which means that the, whatever collateral you put in to, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Ethereum side might not be enough to, to support this, um, to back up the doge that's, that's being supposedly locked. And obviously, if the collateral is too small, then the, the doge could, could just walk off. Okay, so the solution here is to create a separate WOW token for each possible price pair. So we have a WOW zero, a WOW one, a WOW two, so that the WOW n requires a collateral at an exchange rate of one ETH equal to like two of the n doge, that's what I was saying. So just in, in summary, when a hodler with, with WOW three notices the ETH collateral becoming like insufficient, then you just burn, it's her responsibility to burn the WOW three and unlock a doge. So that's, that's so the, the whole point of this is obviously that we don't need, there's no price feed here, right? So it's, it's just whatever that hodler believes the price is and they should convert it. If I think doge, you know, if I, if I just love WOW three, then you don't ever need to worry about this last statement. Um, and then of course, the other thing that you are really concerned about is, is the reserves. Do you have enough, um, is, is the wow that I burn actually backed up by a lock doge on the other side? And so it, I, when they just argue, it's sort of to these cumulative uh, series of invariants is that actually um, the, the number, every wow actually is, is backed up by a lock doge. So, um, so the first invariant just says that the number of wow y in circulation equals y times the number of ETH collateralized at exchange rate y. And that's just kind of, kind of simply because the bridge contract keep, is the thing which mints and burns the, the wow, and so it, it keeps track of what, and also the collateral. So all of that is kept track by a smart contract. So that's, that's pretty simple. Then the other next piece is that a hodler who believes that the value of one ETH exceeds the value of y, wows, wow wise, does not, news, does not lose net value by exchanging wow y through the bridge contract. Um, and that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that was sort of the point, you know, you put in the, the collateral at the, you know, when, when you locked in the bridge, you knew what the, what the exchange rate was. So, um, uh, and, it, and obviously when you burn it, you get back, uh, um, the, you can get the, recollect the, the doge on the other side if the, if the, um, 
in, if the operator doesn't actually return the doge, then you get the collateral, which is actually worth more. And then invariant three, which is obviously probably the most important one, and I think I recap it on this next slide, which is that the true exchange rate, according to all hodlers, is such that one ETH is worth at least Y doge. So this is under the assumption of rational actors. We get that for every Y, the number of locked doge with exchange rate Y on the two true dogecoin blockchain equals the number of wow Y in circulation. And so here I sort of summarize the proof, although um, I think in the interest of time, I just want to sort of summarize with a little bit of implementation. So as we sort of saw in this talk, the true bit together with bullet proofs are kind of versatile verification tools for true weight pegs. But um, our Dogecoin mascot still seeks a machine with large memory to generate linear constraints for the escrip bulletproof. So roughly speaking, this, the, if you follow sort of the construction in, in Jonathan Boodle's original, I guess it's the predecessor to the bulletproofs paper, you know, you're, you're going to take a, um, you generate from a, a circuit a set of constraints. In this case, your circuit, uh, and, and then from that to generate the, the bulletproof itself, the, the pre-processing circuit is, is here rough, roughly 42 million gates, uh, was running out of memory trying to get that to compile. On the TrueBit side, um, you know, it wouldn't, it, we should be, you know, we can check other bulletproofs, that's, that's not a problem. In fact, we can also check S-Crypt, so this is mostly an efficiency thing, but I, I would be, you know, I think if we're gonna use uh, zero knowledge proofs for interesting applications, we, we gotta figure out a way to make this work. Um, yeah, so thanks. Uh, I'll stop there. <laughs>